The matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA 097. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And we are back, Taylor. Hopefully, it's Wednesday and I did the edits on time. If it's not, it's a great Thursday. Um, we'll see. We'll see what day this comes out. TBD, Doesn't how matter. are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce us? I do. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Doom to Fail, the podcast that brings you history's most notorious disasters and epic failures twice a week, every week. I am Taylor, as always, joined by Fars. As always. I never as go anywhere. Always. I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to be. Yeah. I'm always here. Joining like it. Like it. Um, this week, we talked, uh, had a really fun talk about Nostradamus, and now it is my turn to have my little uh doomed to fill story um taylor i'm gonna start this off <clears throat> by just not talking to you i'm talking to the audience so are you ready mm-hmm. okay. yeah but I'm that, was ready. For the, that was for the audience did you just hear oh. what i said we're ready thank you audience yep that was them from far away so i'm gonna go a little bit into our history so Taylor and I, our lives kind of blended in a very fun, unique, interesting way, I think. And um, a lot of really interesting things kind of came out of that. So a little bit of a backdrop. Taylor and I met on February 4th, 2013. I recall that because it was I was moving in on February 3rd, and it was the day of the Super Bowl. And so it was the next day we're going to start work together. It was going to be our first day of work at our previous company. And we're mm-hmm. both, both joining as trainees. I just moved to Los Angeles, literally, like, like I said, like the day before um, from Miami. Taylor moved from New York. We just like we were intro to each other through our, through our work and we started kind of communicating that way. And it's interesting. I don't know about you, but it kind of like formerly this weird punctuation mark in my adult life. Like, yeah, there was like pre that company. And then after that company is like how I look at my life. A thousand percent. It was wild. It yeah. was wild. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and like here, Taylor, Taylor has like, I think we had like different experiences because you things happened to you that we don't need to go into detail that were like not great. Um, I I mostly had a very positive experience, but well, I I I learned a lot about being a pregnant woman in the workplace, which I had never considered before as a thing that I would have to fight for. Uh, I did. That that would be the thing that I. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly that's my experience my I had that you did not have. Um yes. and it was wild and you know, whatever. We're I through it now. Regardless, with- regardless, it was a very, very strange very unique punctuation point in our in our adulthood, I think. Yeah. And um I bring all this up because our friendship kind of evolved from working together. It was th- through just the turmoils of that, through living in Los Angeles, um, and everything that kind of came with it. Um, but I kind of envision us as like going to Los Angeles, all bright eyed and bushy tailed and starting this new chapter in our lives. I mean, so interested and so excited. And it was like, so cool. And we're going to do this startup thing. We're going to change the world and all that. Yeah. So February 4th, we started that tour, that journey. And it was like a fun, cool, like first two weeks in LA in this new job. And then February 19th came around and I don't know, for me, that would be a day that kind of just like shifted my mentality about what Mm -hmm. we're, what we were doing and what was going on. Is there anything that you can think of that I'm referring to here? Is that the cop that went on the run? No, I oh man, I wonder when that was. There's so much. There's so actually. Is it Elisa Lamb? I feel like that was right after. Is that so, it? So so <laughs> Taylor and I are busy working down in our downtown office, changing the world every day, going to work and be like, we're changing the world. A uh, one block west. Three blocks south of us on February 19th, literally half a mile away from where we were sitting, a maintenance worker opened the door to a thousand gallon water tank and discovered the bloated, marbled, green corpse of a woman who had drowned there three weeks earlier. So and I, I I love this story. Thank you for talking about it. I'm so excited. Did, did you? I'm sure. Did you watch the documentary about it? Are you I did. How, how they're like, you take one step out of the hotel, you were in the worst place in America. And I was like, far as and exactly that. Far as and I, bright eyed, bushy tailed down the street, being like, we're changing the world. Do 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 do. And it's like, this is the worst street in all of America. 
I mean, there's parts of that that are accurate. So I, I don't know if you recall, but two of our coworkers literally got punched in the face for no reason. I don't know that. Yeah, Phil got punched in the face. He literally walked out of his apartment and he said some crazy homeless woman turned around to him as he was walking to work and punched him in the face. Another another one of our poor coworkers, I can't remember his name now. He didn't stick around too long. He he had the worst experience. He moved from like San Francisco or something. He was a very, very sweet guy. And he got punched in the face by a homeless person. And then like a month later, he got ran over in Hollywood while trying to cross the street. I forgot what his name was. Do you remember this guy? No, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> he was really bad. That's really funny. And yeah, I mean, I was like, ugh, I just, I'm a very anti downtown LA person. It's really gross. Um, it smells like pee. And that's the least of its problems. Um, but yeah, no, because remember the Citizen app? I don't have it anymore because I live here and I don't feel like there's, I, I needed it. But I had the Citizen app, which would tell you when there's yeah. like crime. And I was connected to you and connected to Alex. And like every day it'd be like, there's a machete attack, right? Right. 10 feet from Alex and he'd have, and he'd be like, it's okay. I'm in my apartment I'm on the third floor. <laughs> it's always like a machete attack in the lobby. <laughs> the stories. So for people who like have never lived or been around this area, the stories you hear of LA in downtown LA, it's like hell on earth. It is literally like hell on earth. Like I remember. So Cameron, I think it was Cameron. Maybe it was Ted. I forgot who it was somebody that we work with again at this company. They lived, they lived somewhere else. They lived, they were visiting from out of town. They came in for some co- some event that was going on in our offices, and they mentioned how they heard they were woken up at like four o'clock in the morning to screaming happening. They looked outside and they 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 said they were haunted by the sound in the vision of someone bouncing somebody else's head off the pavement right outside their window, like just Ugh. constantly beating them until he was like, "I'm sure they died." Like I have no idea how that person would have lived. Anyways, that's the environment that we're talking about. We're, we were all bushy tailed going into. <laughs> We were, we were so super excited and it's like one of the worst places. One more, one more story. I went to, I had like an event to go to and it was a mile away from the office and I was like, oh, I'm going to walk. I like casually said that and Kyle was like, you're absolutely not walking and he drove me there. And I was like, can I just walk a mile? I used to walk like 10 miles a day in New York and they were like, nope, like you can't, there's no safe way to get there. So, so that's the, so I'm going to get into this here in a little bit. So this, so I'm not actually, so I'm going to talk about the lamb situation, Aliza lamb situation, because it's insane. But I'm I'm actually talking mostly about like the history of the Cecil Hotel itself and like um, what what it was all about, and, it, and and that's been covered a lot too. But it, I found a lot of really interesting stuff because I was mostly just curious, like what happened, what, what's what's happening to it today, like what is what's going going on now, and, and that's what like spurred kind of this interest in its history. But um, to your point, there's so many people who go to LA and they accidentally walk into Skid Row because. You go on like the apps and say, "Hey, I'm trying to get to this spot because there's there's basically the clean, domesticated quote unquote part of downtown LA, which is where like mm-hmm. a lot of fancy restaurants are, really cool stuff. Then there's the warehouse district, which is like super hip and in, in like kind of like a grungier kind of a vibe. That's where mm-hmm. Lost Spirits was. I don't know if you ever did Lost Spirits. I think I did that with Jay. But anyways, like that's mm-hmm. where like a lot of like cool stuff goes on um off the side so if you if you're downtown or or you're in the art um the arts district and you want to go to the other side it'll route you directly through skid row yeah and and, and you look at it and you're like okay so like what is that like a half a mile or a mile walk whatever else walk there like i'm not gonna get an uber get the uber always get always uber. it is literally hell on earth do not walk through it yeah so um on that note, yes, we're going to go into the Cecil Hotel because it is it is absolutely fascinating. I was I learned so much about how it came to be and why it is the way that it is and like all the I things around it. it. So the Cecil Hotel, it was kind of rebranded as Stay on Main. And so for the purpose of this conversation, let's call it the Cecil Hotel. Historically, that's what it is. It is actually a historical building now. Um, or it became one in like 2017 or 14. I forget exactly what, but that's what it's known as. So the Mm rebranding also didn't work. Like everybody knows what it is. So you can't just like rename it and be like, this isn't haunted. Yeah. So it was, um, built in downtown LA in 1924. It was imagined by three hoteliers. These guys named William Hanner, Charles Dix and Robert shops. It was designed as an art deco hotel by Lloyd Lester Smith, and it cost about $1.5 million to build back then. The equivalent of about $27 million today. It is 
actually a pretty beautiful hotel. Like if you look at the lobby and if you've mm -hmm. seen um, American Horror Story um, yeah, the hotel series. So that hotel was um, designed after the architectural renderings of the Cecil. So like that's mm -hmm. what it looked like. It, it's beautiful. And I love that that vibe is very like The Shining. Also, R.I.P. Shelley Duvall died this week. Um, R.I.P. Shelley. Um, but yeah, it's like that Art Deco creepy hotel is the best. So cool, so cool. Um, and even even today, actually, well, I'll get into this. I'll get into this. So, at the time, it was built for high flyers. So this is 1924. It was built to the standards of what you would consider like somebody who would be going to a Ritz Carlton, not somebody who's going to a Holiday Inn. It was meant to be kind of like a destination for successful folks. The problem these three guys and the owners of the Cecil were met with almost immediately after opening were threefold. One was the Great Depression kicked off about five years after it had opened. And mm -hmm. and also things just before Great Depression, things aren't great. <laughs> it's not like there's one day when it's Great Depression. It's like it was bad. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like leading up to it. So people people didn't have all that kind of all that much money anyway. So there was that piece of it. The second problem was that, again, Taylor and I's uh, lives kind of tying into this. Our former office was the Biltmore Hotel. And mm -hmm. the Biltmore had opened, again, several blocks up from where the Cecil was further north. And at that time, if the – let's call let's call the Cecil, like, I don't know, like a Hyatt, then the Biltmore was like a Ritz-Carlton. Like, it was, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a notch above. It was also considered the biggest hotel – um in the country at the time so it had a lot more cachet so even people during the great depression who might have had money wanted to visit it weren't going to go to the cecil they're going to go to the biltmore so there was that the third problem it had was what we just talked about skid row so one rumor to dispel wow, even then yeah even then even th so worse than shockingly enough taylor worse like than yeah. I like, and I moved there from New York City, and I was like, I love cities. I lived in New York City for over a decade, and I stepped one foot in downtown LA, and I was like, Oh no, oh yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, it is. I mean, it's kind of a sight to see. God, I remember there was another guy. There's very, very sweet guy we work with. Um, and he was like a great family guy out of um Tennessee, and he lived in Tennessee his whole life, and he would come and visit. And I remember one time we were talking and he was like, I literally cry when I get here because I can't believe the way people live. Like it is just so, Terrible. so, I mean, you literally see people dead on the streets. Like it it's is terrible. not at all unusual to see a dead body, like just walking mm -hmm. around. Anyways, <laughs> go, get back on. Get back I will. On. Yeah. No. So, so one rumor that is worth dispelling right now is that the Cecil's not on Skid Row. Like I said, where Taylor and I worked was only one block up and two blocks away from the Cecil where it currently stands. And where we worked was across from Pershing Square, like one of the, the green parts of downtown L.A. Like it's not in the hellhole that we just described. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the one of like the, the hottest tourist destinations is on the same block as the Cecil, Cole's French Dip, one of the birthplaces of the French Dip sandwich and a really good place to go eat. If you're ever visiting in LA, we've it's definitely right there. been there several times. It's it's a lovely lunch spot if you want to drink a beer and eat a sandwich at lunch. Yeah, we've been there a few. <laughs> it's great, but but it's literally on the same block as the Cecil. Um, yeah. right now this part of downtown is like kind of like the hipper part of downtown. Um, that being said, in the 1930s, when Skid Row was actually forming up as a thing, the boundary line for it, the Cecil, right on the perimeter. So the perimeter. That, that, that is articulated of where Skid Row's original boundary lines were. We're going to be Main Street on the north, which is, again, the street that the Cecil is on. So mm -hmm. to the south of the Cecil is where the – between – so between that street, Main, where the Cecil is, and south towards where the Arts District currently stops is where the bulk of Skid Row actually – is and the reason why it ended up forming there is just because like that kind of a place held the businesses that would attract homeless people. It had a lot of, for example, SROs or single room occupancy 
hotels that were daily or weekly mm -hmm. um, rentals. And that's kind of how it developed. As of right now, there's an approximate 6,000 people living out in the open in the streets of Skid Row, which is like a drop in the bucket. I think that overall, the total Los Angeles homelessness is somewhere around 100,000. 6,000 are on the streets of um, uh, Skid Row. When the Cecil wow. opened, that number was 10,000. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So it's actually like gone down. I also like, I don't know. I feel like I know about single room occupancy things and things like that from like learning about the past, you know, like I don't feel like I know about it from now, but that must still be a thing where you can like do things. Like that. I, I feel like I, I think about it as like a, a great depression, like old thing. And here's a, a deep rub and a book that I know you've not read, but there's a book called Sister Carrie. Um, if anyone's read it, I have um, read that. you have not where they like very in detail talk about living in these, in these situations where men would like stand on the street and then like some of them would be given a room and some of them wouldn't be, you'd have a, it was like a whole thing. So yes. Uh, th this is still a thing. So like if you drive on the highways of Texas, you will come upon um, hotels that have weekly and monthly rates, mm -hmm. sometimes even hourly rates, um, which is, terrifying because what are you doing in their hourly <laughs> well you're doing sex work in their hourly but i think that like the um another thing that i saw on social media about a motel that was like kind of a crappy motel that was like that kind of motel but they were like the people who stay here are people who are like running away from abusive partners you know they like need to take a shower they need to chill their insulin like stuff like that that like you know, this is a, a terrible way to live. Some of it's really like, actually, we're going to get into this here a little bit later. Some of it is like super, super sad situations that yeah. people should be helping with. And other times it's just like, we don't need to see any of this, but we'll, we're going to we, get into that. Are we going to, can we blame Ronald Reagan yet? Or we get, we'll do that in a little bit. So this doesn't really touch on Reagan, although you could blame a, a part of it on the shutting down of mental institutions i'm sure cool. yeah um but anyways well th th so here's the thing those people would end up in jail i don't know anyways we'll, we'll, we can talk about that later but so anyways as the years progressed the cecil didn't really keep up with the time so it eventually found itself more suited to being an sro at, rather than a luxury hotel so like for examples and by the 1980s Guests of the Cecil still had to use like the same bathrooms on the same uh, like per floor, mm -hmm. as opposed to like you know now where you expect your hotel to have a bathroom in yes in the room. So from the 1930s on, it was kind of a slow and steady decline as some notable events took place. Several worth discussing. There were nine suic suicides that occurred that are documented that range from poisoning, jumping from a high floor, slitting one's own throat, and a gunshot wound to the head. There was at least two murders, but there was also a few suspected ones that aren't on the list, which include Lisa Lamb. Um, one mm -hmm. of those murders was a 19-year-old woman who, in 1944, while staying at the Cecil with her boyfriend, was secretly pregnant and didn't know it or didn't tell anyone. And she went to labor in the bathroom, and she ended up just taking the baby and throwing it out of the window. Mm, don't love that. Not good. No. Four others, we don't know if it's murder or suicide, were people who somehow landed dead from a high floor. So uh, there was a lot of those. And the most recent one was in 2015. So, wow. so yeah. Um, the Cecil kind of operated as like a battery of evil, attracting just ho horrible people. I mean, I, I have a hard time saying horrible people because like you don't know what someone's circumstances are, right? Like you don't know why someone ends up in the situation they end up in. So like, I don't know, like mm -hmm. I just, I, it just sounds like hell on earth is what it sounds like. It, it sounds like the walls of that place is just absolutely just garbage. I think it's like a, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like if you, you know, the people who like need that are probably troubled, you know, and then like, who knows what's going to happen. So the, for example, this battery of evil theory, there's some, uh, punctuation marks on this that are worth noting so for example the black doll elizabeth short the last sighting of her was apparently at the um at the cecil hotel which i think you called out it was that it was and like, more so she so it's it's not known for sure so like she was also seen presumably seen at the biltmore but she was also presumably seen at the cecil but like it's 19 it's the 1930s like people are gonna make stuff up so we don't know or it yeah. could be part of like the myth building of the seesaw but we do know for sure is that in room 1419 
during the 1980s, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, was living there. <laughs> he was <laughs> living at the Cecil while going around and killing people. This story is incredible. I did not know this. Apparently, so it was $14 a night. That's what he was paying. And after a murder, he was covered in blood. What he would do is he would go to the Cecil. Okay, by the way, this is what downtown LA is like. <laughs> Like that, this guy was covered in blood. You can be covered in blood there. You could be covered in blood there. What he would do is he would go to the dumpsters on the ground floor of the Cecil, strip naked, throw all of his bloody clothes in the dumpster. Then he would walk up to his room naked. That's what the Cecil was like. <laughs> and no one knew he was a night star. No one was like, nobody thought it was weird. Uh, shortly after his reign of terror, the Cecil, uh, Cecil, another famous serial killer, Jack Unterweger, an Australian Austrian writer and serial killer, made his way to L.A. And he stayed at the Cecil where he went on to kill three prostitutes. Uh, that's what he did in the U.S. He killed a further seven in Austria and one in Czechoslovakia. Uh, so that's kind of the history of some of the folks that were living there. Mm-hmm. Um so as we get into the early 2000s, Skid Row ends up getting pushed further south from Maine. So that basically means the Cecil's completely out of being Skid Row. It's not on the boundary line anymore. And so the owners of the Cecil thought, this is our chance to kind of um, redo this. How do we take this dirty, seedy, bloody, disgusting, underground reputation of this shithole hotel filled with heroin needles? What do we do with it? We're going to rebrand it in 2011 as a stay on Maine. Which is like just so stupid, like so stupid. And didn't they like? I think we talk about this, but it's like it was like still two hotels, but they had like changed the lobby. Yeah, so they didn't change the lobby. It was it was um it was the Cecil, and then it was stay, stay on Main was meant to be like a hostel type of an environment. So like I said, mm-hmm. a lot of people were sharing bathrooms, and so mm-hmm. that suited more like hostel living. And so what they were trying to advertise themselves as where where the hostel on this side, and we're like a boutique hotel on this other side got it and they have separate entrances and separate branding but it but you were still at it was the same shit like you were on the same floor right you were like sharing an elevator you were sharing elevators exactly yeah um and so that was basically what what they decided to do the idea being that we're going to position ourselves for low budget travelers i could have sworn we've like we tried to think try to plan like actually staying at the cecil at one point and decide against it we may have. And I feel like the thing I'm most afraid of is, like, bugs. Uh, it really, really, really bad roach and uh, mice problem there. Yeah. Yeah. That checks out. So one traveler, obviously, that decided to take advantage of this hostile, low-cost living was Elisa Lam. Again, this story's been covered a million times. The Netflix documentary on it was absolutely incredible. I'll get into the high points of this because it's just so crazy. So good. Like, it's so- terrible, but... I have several thoughts after you're done. So it's funny because I actually literally have a bold outline part of this where I'm like, Taylor, what do you think of it? Exactly. Great. Perfect. <laughs> so, so the the highlights of this are uh, Lam was a 21-year-old Vancouver resident. She was studying at the University of British Columbia. She suffered from mental illness and had exhibited weird patterns of erratic behavior. She was put on a number of medications to kind of calm her symptoms. She eventually would withdraw from the University of British Columbia and decided to take a trip south to California via the Amtrak on January 26, 2013. I guess I was like, what, like a week before you and I arrived? She arrives in L.A. and checks into the Cecil. Uh, She was apparently in a shared room until a roommate complained about her behavior, including leaving notes for her, telling her to go away. And make, locking the door and making her use passwords to get back into her own room, which is, like, crazy. Apparently, she also went to a uh, taping of the Conan O'Brien show and made such a ruckus. They kicked her out. She was, like, escorted <laughs> out by security. Yeah. She was, like. I mean, she definitely should have continued to be on her meds. Yeah. That's the, the part of the lesson here is if you need medication and it, you feel better, stay on that medication. It is helping you. Yeah. Yeah. You're not Did cured. It... You need to be on your medication. And as, you know. Clearly, they don't didn't do she yeah she had some medication. Well, let, me, let me get to that. So on January thirty first, she was supposed to check out of the Cecil, and she didn't. She'd also been contacting her parents every day to let them let them know about her whereabouts, and she also stopped calling. And so they ended up calling the LAPD, and they flew down to LA themselves to help figure out what's going on with her. Mm-hmm. Um, 
police used dogs to search the hotel and couldn't find anything. A week later, they went to putting up fires around the neighborhood. And then a week after that, the police released the last known recording of Lamb, which still gives me chills because I already, like, I rewatched it. Uh, like, I literally am getting goosebumps right now, like, talking to you. I know, it's the best. Um, Taylor, what do you think of the video? Okay, so... <laughs> I scared the fucking shit out of myself one time Googling the elevator game. Have you ever Googled the elevator game? Oh my God. No. I actually have chills right now. Okay. So she, okay. So this lamb, this is me by memory is in the elevator, like pressing a bunch of buttons, but like moving and looking out the, looking out the doors and like looking back and like maybe talking to someone like out of the camera and like in the camera. And it's like really weird. Right. Yes. So I was like, I don't know, looking this up, of course. And there's this game called the elevator game, which is not what she was doing, but it's like a thing where you like press a button and then go to a floor and the door will open. And then you do like a couple other like in uh in order. And then on one floor, you close your eyes and a woman will get on the elevator, but you can't look at her. And then you have to like press another one and do a thing. And then you're like, then you're somewhere else. And like, it's so creepy. And there's actually a pretty good horror movie called the elevator game where they do it. And it is, it's scary. So like thinking that she might've been doing that was scary, but also she's obviously having a psychotic breakdown. Have you ever done that? The elevator game? I would absolutely never do it. No. Elevator. Guys, if anybody's it's, done this, can you please? It scares the us? shit out of me. And it's like one of those things where you're like, why does why it scare the shit out of me? And I'm like, uh uh, not doing it. No way. It's too scary. Uh, what do you what do you recall about the video? What did you what did you feel or think when you watched the video? So I've also heard rumors that like she was seeing a ghost or she was talking to someone, you know. Richard Ramirez had not died yet. So people were like, maybe it's him or like his ghost or but he wasn't dead so no um she obviously looks like she's in distress and yeah. she, she looks very like just she looks like she's looking for someone following her right? yeah. yeah yeah that sounds about right is is that the thing you remember the most about the whole case is the creepiest thing about the case no i remember people, people brushing their teeth with the dead body water great so the next part i'm going into is on february 19th <laughs> hotel guests started complaining <laughs> about the water they started complaining that the color was off the taste was off the water pressure was low um so on that morning the hotel maintenance worker went onto the roof and opened one of the four 1000 gallon water tanks and found her lying face down naked Uh, she had been in there decomposing for three weeks i want to die I what, like, would you do? what would you do? I, I literally, I was thinking to myself, like, would I just drink bleach or like, what would I do? Like, I can't. What imagine. would you do? How would you? What would you do? I don't know. I what don't you, would, know. You, you would have to like, you would have to join every major religion and go to every. You were you were eating. I would you, need you an exorcism. Human. I would need to see a shaman of some sort. Um, maybe ayahuasca and just throw it all up. God damn. I mean, so bad. Oh my god, and also like. What else is in those water tanks? Like, how is that a way to store water in 2020? Yeah, so so I, I'm getting into, into that, too, because apparently cause what ended up happening was this guy obviously reported this to the police. Police would drain the tank, cut a hole into it to recover her body. She was autopsied. Her death was uh, reported as accidental drowning with bipolar disorder, disorder as a significant factor. No drugs of consequence were found in her system, except for the ones that she was prescribed, but she was also under medicating herself, which was clear given the mm-hmm. amount of drugs that she was, was in her system. She had a tiny amount of alcohol in her system. And then the question became, how did she actually get into the tank to begin with? Because there was no direct guest access to the roof. Mm-hmm. So all police could ascertain was that when they originally did the search with the dogs, the dogs lost her scent at a window that was connected to a fire escape, which if you oh. climbed, it would take you up to the roof. And, and they then, didn't go up to the roof. Yeah. Yeah, she apparently climbed. That once you're on the yes, roof, she disappeared out this window. Uh, yeah, no I don't way know why. Well, they could have assumed that maybe she like. Actually, I don't know what they thought. Yeah, like, you're she right. She would either be on the ground. She either went up or down. Right. <laughs> Simply, maybe it was a bad. Maybe they, they didn't think the dog was good at, at sniffing. I don't know. <sighs> it was his first day. I don't. I don't maybe know that dog's life. Day. Yeah. Um, so apparently, at that point, she climbed an eight foot ladder and then went inside the tank. And then you assume that she was like opening the well, no, she got naked, then she got into the tank. So what ended up being concluded out of this was that two of the tanks, there's four of them, two of the tanks, the doors were just left open, the water tank, which begs the question, 
What else were they drinking? That's what they're like. Oh, yes, that's exactly my question. How many dead pigeons? <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking of dead birds and dead rats and like. Oh my god! I need like seven. What a shithole hotel! What a horrible, horrible. But every hotel. building in like LA has that, like right? Like all the, the downtown, there's a lot of those wooden water tanks, and in New York and everywhere, you know, like what is in those water tanks? Why is it up there? So gross. Why is that the way we're doing water now? It's not so like, gross. Oh my god! I'm gonna, I'm drinking a, a a cream soda. I'm just gonna drink cream soda from now on. I'm not gonna drink water anymore. Taylor, how terrifying is that? You. You, from her perspective, you're in a thousand gallon tank. I feel like this happened in like a couple of movies where people die in water tanks. Like, I think what happened in like that Baz Luhrmann Australia movie and like maybe in a horror movie. But like, once you get in, you can't get out. You know, yeah, you can't get like, out. There's no like, there's like a, you know, depending on how much water is in there, there's like several feet of water tank yeah. between you and the entrance. Well, she it's also... easy to get in, but hard to get out. Well, she also closed the latch on her way in, and so that's heavy oh, too. And in, in a water tank, you have nothing to push off of. So yeah, you're yeah. Just... Wow, that's really scary. I'm getting chills. I don't like this story. Oh my god. Also, Taylor, the movie is called Dark Water. It was from 2005 when, um, what's her name? Oh god, Jennifer Connelly. Her and her daughter move into a uh, an, a, a rundown apartment building, and the water is all gross. And they eventually go to the roof, and they find that there was a dead girl that was killed and stuffed in the water tank. Oh God! In two thousand five, oh, and God. the name of the daughter that she moves in with is Cecilia, really close to Cecil. Isn't there something else that spells out Elisa Lamb, like a mm. parasite or something? What's the other thing? Thing. yeah there's like something oh my god i'll find it later there's something they were like they found like a thing that it, in the water that was like a a parasite that is named an elisa lamb or like a lamb or something anyway i'm not, I'm not gonna write that keep going so um so one part about this case that i kind of loved reading about was that the parents apparently ended up filing a lawsuit against the Cecil Hotel about creating an unreasonable risk of harm for its guests. And then I was like, if is it unreasonable or is it reasonable okay. to assume that your guests aren't going to climb onto the roof and then get inside? like Out of a window, up a fire escape, climb the ladder, go in. I mean, it's crazy. You would, you would never have guessed that, that was something that was going to happen. It's absolutely crazy. So, anyways, that gets thrown out of court. They're like, obviously, we're dismissing this because, like, like it's terrible, Earth. of course. And I feel so right. feel so bad for them. Right. But that's not. Yeah, that's not on them. What can you do? So, so, anyways, we move on. Um, we are in the year 2014. So, it's, so the owners of this, so like, let's get rid of our ghost hotel. And so they ended up selling it to a real estate holding company. The plan was to revitalize a hotel. And um, again, by this time, it wasn't part of Skid Row. Instead, they thought we just shut this place down for renovations and um, and just really tear it from the ground up, essentially. Uh, unfortunately, during this process, COVID also uh, hit L.A. and all this work was suspended. So the hotel and all operations were shut down during this time because they were planning on just doing the full renovations. But it's noted that a content creator, this guy named Pete Montzingo, uh, he had a he has a YouTube channel. You can look him up. He uh, moved into an apartment building directly across from the Cecil while it was unoccupied, and he just started recording this thing day and night. And the shit you saw, like it, again, it will make your skin crawl. Like what what happened was that he was crowdsourcing because I mean it was just literally recording twenty four seven. So he was crowdsourcing from people like, hey, tell me if you see anything on this like live stream of the Cecil. And so people would just message him in and say, hey, at this time marker. Look at this window over on this side, this many floors up, and you'd see stuff going on. There's stuff happening, like lights would be coming going on and off. You'd see things moving inside the inside the Cecil. You'd see people show up on the balcony and go away. Like it was really creepy. I'm 100 percent watching The Shining tonight. I've guessed, and I'm gonna oh, make them yeah. watch it. That's a really good. That's a really good uh, honor to Shelley Duvall and yeah. haunted hotels. Yeah. Uh, the the his, the one that I was watching. So I was watching one. The video is entitled Proof. Hotel Cecil is haunted. And again, if you go to Time Markers 316 and 514, 
you see someone doing stuff. Like there's someone yeah. there inside the hotel. I mean, who knows? Like it could have been that homeless people broke in and stayed there, but how creepy is that? In this giant 14 floor. Wait, tell me the when to go what to, what to go. So it's 316 and then 514. Okay. Uh, Might be like a second before that because whatever, like but you'll you'll get it. Oh, I see. Okay. But the people probably were in there. Right? Yeah. I mean it was even though like it was like, like maybe like somebody broke in or yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever, but like it seems like there's a lot of activity happening in a seemingly abandoned hotel. And it's it just adds to the lore of how unbelievably creepy this thing is. It's so creepy, I love it. <laughs> wow. Um I heard so someone else that we worked with had said that. I, I won't even tell you who it was, but they had told me that they saw some someone that they know had a wedding there at Stay on Main, and they had like they like saw someone that like wasn't invited to the wedding, and it was like not a real person. Wait, the person that we know went to a wedding there. Yeah, and they like saw someone there that like wasn't real. Or what do you mean wasn't real? Like it was a ghost. Interesting. Is it someone credible? <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna say their name. <laughs> <laughs> I have like a short list that I you suspect. <laughs> um, so, anyways, um, part of the hotel reopened in late 2021, but I mean, it was pretty much 2022, it was like February or December, like 13, 2021. So, call 2022. Only reason I'm pointing that out is because COVID was kind of like a little bit going away, and so it ended up reopening and they got enough work done to get it up in, in, in uh, working order. Uh, at that time, it essentially became a low-income boarding house. So mm -hmm. as of late 2023, um, the Cecil has about 318 residents receiving rental subsidies from the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority or the Department of Health. Um, there is – well, I'll get uh, – I'll talk about this in a minute. But the conditions are horrible, horrible, mm. horrible, horrible. There's mold everywhere. The building – uh rooms the, the building itself the rooms the facilities all are in disrepair all of them are dilapidated there's roaches and mice throughout the place the elevator breaks constantly there are only two washers and two dryers for the entire 600 oh room hotel and um one thing they mentioned is like these people don't have any money so like when they do their laundry they break it because they load every possible thing they can stuff into the damn washer sure. in there and and it breaks and oh. so and again you're dealing with severely traumatized and mentally ill homeless people and um and so obviously there's a lot of substance abuse there's obviously a lot of violence that's taking place within its walls yeah um, i was reading an la times article and the entire time i was reading this article i was thinking i imagine that what these living conditions are like or is basically like what prison is like like a horrible 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 prison yeah surrounded by crazy people who care about nothing and are constantly making life in the conditions around you worse and more miserable then i get towards the end where a resident has quoted it as saying this about the room saying quote they're like prison cells and i was like oh okay well there you go That's yeah because exactly i mean you look at the pictures and you're like what it just looks like hell like again it's just like hell on earth like yeah um a while ago, I was listening to this podcast about homelessness. Um, I think it was You're Wrong About, which I've quoted before in the past. They're basically talking about the conditions of homelessness and how to get out of homelessness and stuff like that. And one thing that they brought up that seemed like an obvious solution to homelessness is to provide housing. And yes. the example that they cited were people who had like a string of bad luck, kind of like what you referred to earlier to. It's like a woman who was in an abusive relationship or had mm -hmm. a drug addiction and left but had no source of income so she slept in her car then she racked up some tickets or her car got towed so now she's homeless and she can't get far enough ahead to get out of homelessness without housing so mm -hmm. that's a situation like an example or an anecdotal piece where a roof over that person's head would actually change their lives completely like that would be like yeah. the, the the thing that goes on but the problem with the cecil today is that putting a well the thing that the Cecil today illustrates that putting a roof over any homeless person's head actually doesn't solve anything because they have no services. They have mental health yeah. problems that they can't get over. 
all you're doing is taking the conditions of being homeless on the streets and putting them in a container so that people can't see it and can't actually help it. I watch this like I watch a lot of videos of like conservatives like kind of accidentally getting getting to the getting around to it. And there is one this this young woman who was like, homeless people don't want help. Like they actually like don't need houses. They need like mental health services. And it was just like she went so conservative she ended up socialist because you're like, yeah, of course they do. They need help. I know if you go far along in one one path, you eventually cross over to the other side. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean th that's so the conditions there are I mean, what we described at the top of this episode, what Skid Row is, take that and put it in a building. That's literally yeah. what, what it is today. Um, and, you know, you look at why that's the situation. And the reason is that the owners of the building need to make money. And, well, they yeah. probably don't need to make money, but they want to make money. And these subsidies is how they get paid. Because, you know, what, what else are you going to do with it? What are you going to open it as a hotel? It's a, it's a roach motel like nobody would stay there does so does stay on main still exist i think so oh no it says closed as of july 2024 okay yeah so but you know what yeah actually that entire concept i guess will be done away with because it's not a hotel anymore it's literally just like right. low-income housing and so these guys, owners of the Cecil Down, get paid off these vouchers the government is providing. And so that's why they, why they open without any any sort of um, assistance or therapy or mental health or anything. Uh, eventually, the game plan was turn that beautiful lobby that actually is very, very beautiful, turn that beautiful lobby into kind of like a receiving area for all kinds of services for the homeless. And so that's essentially mm -hmm. what it's kind of turning into. Um, so they have plans of bringing this stuff online. It's just not there right now. Um, mm -hmm. and so, uh, it should get there eventually. Uh, the name of the, the name of that LA times article, which is actually free. If you want to read it, um, Cecil hotel housing, homeless tenants problem, um, is hmm. kind of the, the name of it. So, um, and, and there's, the and there's pictures of the Cecil on there as well. Like what the interior looks like. There are, um, I'm reading the reviews um for google reviews of it and they're hilarious one of them is terrible experience heard footsteps from the hallway nobody was there maintenance suspicious as hell <laughs> anyway don't um, stay there you dumb yeah yeah obviously don't god i mean I, I wanted to just because i was like it's so creepy it's so scary like it's so haunted um there there was um someone who said i forgot what it was where i read this but somebody said that the higher up you go, the more sense of like just desperation and like mm. evil you feel, um, which I find interesting because the top floor, well, the top floor is 15, but they don't have a 13. Well, yeah. So the, yeah, 14, yeah, yeah. the 14th floor is the 13th floor. Right. And I think yeah. that's the floor that Richard Ramirez was on. And so nice. the fact that they kind of reference evilness is like, it, it's kind of cool. Can um, you imagine like, He wasn't like devoid of blood when he took all of his clothes off. He's still wearing his like sambas or whatever shoes he was wearing, you know. So he's still wearing his shoes. He his head his hair is covered in blood. He looks like Richard Ramirez. So he looks like he's out of his fucking mind. His teeth are falling out. He's his hands are bloody and he's naked. He's like, hey guys. I kind of I kind of love have... it. What? Like I just it's like Oh it's like God. what a what a great encapsulation. Like you literally don't have to tell anybody anything else about anything going on in LA in the 1980s and downtown. All you have to do is tell them that story, and it's like I never want to be anywhere around this. <laughs> yep, that is it. That's the that's the answer. Uh, it's interesting, actually. Yeah. So the hundredth year anniversary of the Cecil is this year. So like I said, it opened on December 20th, 1924. So in a few months, we're going to celebrate the 100th year of the Cecil, which again is a historic. Uh, landmark um i don't know why <laughs> i mean that is a really great question i feel like potentially because of the architecture and like the dream you know but everything but i like, read no. about the cecil everything i read about it was like just knock it down like it is just misery just knock it down build something cool and fly and, yeah. and nice on, on on that property which will build like a high rise apartment, you know, and then like people will pay an atrocious amount of money to live there, even though it's gross. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, for the for what it's worth, I've stayed inside the Biltmore, and the Biltmore is also terrifying. And it's no, like I know. a nice place. I stayed in the Biltmore, too. I also stayed in a similar vibe. I stayed in a hotel in Culver City. I think it's just called the Culver. Um, And it was very, it was very much like that. It was like, um, it's the same architecture. It's creepy. When you get in, it's like dark and they have like a jazz band playing and they give you a glass of champagne. And I'm like, are you a ghost lady who's checking me in? <laughs> you know, like you're in like a little tiny elevator with like a grate, you know, like a, a gate like that. It was, it was lovely. I really liked that. Um, that was when at my last job, I stayed an extra night after a, a meeting and I refused to go back to the shitty Marriott. They always let us, made us stay at. So I booked yeah. myself at the Culver and no one said anything. Um, but yeah, the I, I liked when I stayed at the Biltmore one night because I was losing my mind. My husband bought me an, a night there um, with my this. two young children. I went to the pool. The pool was really fun. It, it felt like being on the Titanic. You know, uh, you know, like, as we were talking, I literally thought about that because I remember you told me you went to the pool. It was like in the morning or something. You went. Yeah, I went something in the morning, which is out of character. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I just thought how scary it must have been. Because, it was. Yeah, because it was. It's not. An, it, it's an indoor pool. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the, it's in the basement. And it's like child and like it's cool, but it's scary. I have a let me see. Yeah, I'm gonna look cool. Wait, this can't be it. Oh, that's the Biltmore. Oh my god, that one's really scary. So uh I went with oh yeah, me and you we did this together. We went to the Biltmore State the North in North Carolina, I remember, and uh-huh. they showed us the pool and I was like, This is the most terrifying, <laughs> terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. It was like a weird inside. It's so scary. Look it up. Oh, look up the Biltmore. If you look up indoor Biltmore pool. The first pictures are this pool, which is like the scariest pool in the world. I'm going to look at the L.A. one. Okay, this one's not terrible. I mean, the the one in the house is way scarier than the one in the Biltmore. I was like in the basement. It's weird. Yeah. Okay, I can't look at this. It makes me scared. Yay. I'm scared. Um, it is 10 o'clock in the morning, and I am afraid. So, so there thank was, you. So in, on April 9th of 2022, there was another story coming out of Mexico in Monterey of a girl woman i don't know she's like 18 19 years old whatever you want to call her uh dabani uh escobar who was also found in a uh water tank uh. yeah uh that story i didn't go super into the details of it just came up as like a, hey this is another very similar um story to elisa lamb and so i'm gonna i'm gonna read more of that and see what comes of it but uh yeah it's sounds terrifying what a terrible dark and scary way to go yeah yeah so well that was super fun um, that was like a walk through our friendship <laughs> and i loved it <laughs> yeah yeah we went uh went all the way back i mean it i i sometimes forget how close in time the lisa lamb thing happened to when we moved there and you look at that and you're like yeah we were just really excited and just happy to be there and it's like two weeks later like they're flying a tank over us on a helicopter that they're taking to some police facility that a woman drowned in. It's just like crazy. Did you in the documentary? There's that like sweet European couple who were sitting there. Remember, and they were like, "Yeah, the water started to get weird, and, like all the things." And they're like, "Oh my god, you poor babies." Yeah, I have no idea. Again, I think I think you would just have to. I don't. I don't know. It's weird. How would you? God, if you drank that water, oh my god. Oh my god! And uh, I also I really like American Horror Story Hotel. That's the best one. It has the great vibe. Um, I really like it. I, I, do you agree it's the best one? No, I like Roanoke, but um, but I do really like Hotel. Those Roanoke, first, those favorite. first five seasons were just absolutely killer. I didn't really get yeah. into the most recent one. The most oh my god, the most recent one was terrible. Like. Just terrible. With Kim Kardashian. Uh, yeah. Like it ended and I was like, what the hell? Like it didn't, it was just so stupid and so bad. Um, but I will keep watching it forever as long as I keep making it because I'm waiting for a good one. So Murder House Asylum Hotel. I think those were the best ones. Did you see Roanoke? I saw parts of Roanoke. You've I like you that bring one a lot. up the teeth <laughs> story oh, all the time. Enough to where I feel like I might as well have seen it. You should. You should. We should make that same pact. If if I tell you I saw teeth falling from the sky, I need you to believe me, and I need you to help me. Um, I will believe you. Deal. Okay. Deal. Um, cool. Well, we can go ahead and wrap up. Is there anything you want to leave us off with? Um, 
No, thank you, um, everyone for listening and for sharing and everybody who is, is, has written in. Um, we're at doomedtofailpod at gmail.com and doomedtofailpod on all the social medias. So please tell your friends. Please tell your friends. Awesome. Thanks, Taylor. We're going to Thanks, cut it Rex. off. Bye. <laughs>